Um, Andy, and for all of you joining us today, um, welcome to everyone who's able to be with us on the call this afternoon. Um, I have a couple of sort of top of show announcements to make. So welcome to this edition of Will's World Shorts. Um, hopefully you're in the right place. We're talking about outreach and engagement and how to make space for both. Um, I am your host and your presenter today. My name is Laura Damon Moore, um, and I am speaking to you today from Will's, although you'll hear about um, some additional contexts for me in a moment. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we are recording today's session. Obviously, hopefully you heard that um, get started. This will be sent to all people um, who signed up, um, who registered for this event next week and posted to the Wills website. So if you need to leave early for any reason, um, you know, this will be recorded and shared after the fact. So, um, you know, we'll keep it pretty informal. Please feel free to step away or exit the meeting as needed today. Um, let me see, what else can I tell you? Um, there should be some time at the end for some Q&A today, but Andy will keep an eye on the chat sort of throughout our time together. And just let me know if there are things that need to be clarified, terms that got lost in the shuffle, um, things like that. So please feel free um, if you have questions along the way to post those in chat. Um, and I think feel free to, to use the raise hand feature in Zoom. As I said, we're going to keep things pretty informal. So, um, but you know, if you have deeper questions or want to go into anything more in detail, um, we can save those for the end and sort of dig into those together. All right. Any questions before I sort of get things more rolling here? Rolling even more. All right, hearing and seeing none, um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next portion here. Whoops. Let's see if I can, there we go. All right, um, so our presenter, your presenter today, it's me. I'm Laura Damon Moore. My pronouns are she and her. I am um, part of our Wills consulting team at the moment. I am a library strategist and consultant for um, with Wills. Um, previously, I have been a um, youth services librarian and then a community engagement librarian at public libraries around the state of Wisconsin. So um, today, what you're going to hear from me is um, me framing out some definitions of outreach and of engagement. I'm going to share a couple of stories with you from my context as a youth librarian at a small public library in South Central Wisconsin, um, eager free public library in Evansville for anyone playing the home game here. Um, and then I'm going to pull out some lessons learned about time management, planning, and prioritizing outreach and engagement work. So I would say certainly I'm still learning about this stuff. There's no one specific way um, to do outreach and engagement, but um, they are a little bit different in terms of their approaches and outcomes. And um, it's important to think about your time and building time into your day differently um, in support of both of those approaches. Um, I'll be sharing some resources along the way and then at the end, so you'll have access to all of the links and graphics that I share um, after our time together today. And then, as I said, there should be time for questions at the end. My portion should take just about 45 minutes or so, um, and then we will certainly wrap up by two o'clock today. All right, um, before we go much farther, I would love to um, just have some introductions from you all. Um, so if you can today, if you're joining us um, on the call, please feel free to share in chat a little bit about who you are, any organization or institution you're representing today, um, and a sentence or two about your context. So your organization or institution type, maybe your position if you wanna share that, and then maybe just a couple of words, a sentence or so about what brings you here today to this um, presentation in particular. So just um, for some information gathering, I think it'd be interesting to know that. So um, yeah, that would be wonderful if you wouldn't mind doing that. 
And then I'll just move right along into some table setting for today. So as far as defining outreach and engagement, this is um, a graphic that I return to with some frequency to think about the sort of spectrum of work that exists um, in terms of community facing work from community outreach to community engagement. Um, so they're, you know, not um, always super clearly defined, um, but there are um, some differences between them. This is a definition or like a graphic um, that is from the website leadingdifferently.com. It's about um, sort of collective action, um, societal community change, that sort of thing. Um, and I just think it's sort of an interesting way to think about these two community facing approaches um, that um, we do in library work and also in whatever context you're bringing to the table. So um, this was originally shared with me by a colleague um, who's also a librarian, Veranda Pitchford from the Khalifa um, Library Consortium out in California. So I just want to um, give her a tip of the hat um, because I think this is a really interesting conversation starter, um, if nothing else. So um, yeah, so let's go through these items a little bit. So over on the left hand side, the way that helps me think about community engagement is that it's sort of a short term undertaking or prospect. It's not necessarily multi year. It's sort of um, in support of a particular um, thing, whether that's like a, a marketing campaign, a strategic planning process, um, something like that. So um, it's a little bit shorter term. Maybe it's a couple of hours. It's a couple of days. It's a couple of weeks. Um, the one of the primary goals of community outreach is um, related to marketing. So what um, services or resources does your organization, whether that's a public library, school library, academic library, historical society, archive, you know, what do you have um, that you want to promote and share um, and communicate about with your community? A question that comes up in a community outreach context setting is what can A do for B? Um, so we can think about our organizations as filling that A role sometimes. So what can our organizations do or provide for the community that we're a part of and that we're serving? We can also sometimes as organizations fill the B role. So what can our community do for our organizations? That um, might come out in terms of input and feedback. So we want um, to know how people are, um, you know, using our services and um, interacting with our resources and things like that. Um, it tends to be that one group benefits most in a community outreach setting. Um, it's transactional, which um, in this context means that it might be related to a project. And um, once the work on that project is done, there might not be an, a lot of ongoing communication um, beyond maybe sharing like the results or the final product of something. Um, and it's directional. So the way I think about that is in my mind, it's an assumption that change is always moving in a particular direction um, and that progress is moving in a particular direction. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have community engagement. Um, this is a longer term prospect. Um, so sometimes we might use community engagement and outreach interchangeably, um, but um, we're, you know, sometimes actually talking about outreach um, and, um, and vice versa. But community outreach or community engagement, excuse me, tends to be long term, built up over, you know, many months, many years of being involved um, in an organization within a community. Um, it's really um, focused on relationship building. That's um, a real goal of community engagement. Um, so it's, um, yeah, so the focus is on developing relationships, both between your organization and the community that you're working with, um, and also um, maybe facilitating relationship building between and among community members. 
A question that comes up in community engagement settings is, what can A and B do together? And this is one that I hang my hat on a lot. It's um, rather than what can A do for B, it's what can A and B do together? Um, so it's um, leveling the playing field a little bit um, and sort of bringing together um, our mutual power and um, for collective action. The whole community benefits. So when A and B are working together and collaborating together, everybody across the community benefits. Um, there isn't one group that's benefiting the most. It's about connecting. So um, the, you know, the, the point is not necessarily like a product or a project. Um, the point is the connections that are made between people along the way. And it's cyclical. So this is an assumption, is the way I think about it, an assumption that change is always building off of previous work that there are mistakes and lessons learned along the way, and that you are reflecting on work that you've done previously and sort of building off of that, um, rather than starting fresh or assuming um, that you're always moving in, in one particular direction. I also like to think about this in terms of the individual sort of life cycle of people's engagement, like in terms of civic engagement. So sometimes depending on your life context and circumstances, people are going to be more or less engaged um, with the work, you know, that's happening in their community, participating civically, things like that. Um, so it also relates to that, you know, sort of understanding and embracing that people are always experiencing um, different levels of engagement, what they can offer, and um, when they might need to step back when they're burned out, things like that. So as you can see, hopefully, from these definitions, both of these approaches have a place and a role. So sometimes what I find and have found is that outreach is a great way to get your foot in a door. Um, it's a wonderful starting point for longer term relationships and um, engagement, you know, activities and work. Um, so, and also in my experience, it is possible to build relationships when you're doing outreach. Um, so if you're tabling at an event, you can um, connect with people and develop um, relationships, maybe um, reinforce relationships that already exist and lay the, lay the foundation for new ones. However, if all you're doing and making time and space for is outreach activities, if it's all just, you know, tabling at community events and sending out surveys and um, things like that, that ends up overlooking the collective energy and power that is abundant in every single community we work in. Um, so I know that these ideas and these concepts might resonate for you more or less depending on your context. Your organization might also have different ways of thinking about um, these community facing approaches um, to our work. So I just want to, you know, sort of leave space for you all to please feel free to share your thoughts on this in, in chat. Do these items resonate for you? Where do they resonate less? Um, do they show up for you in your work? That sort of thing. I think it'd be interesting um, to hear that from um, people who are on the call today. So please feel free to share those thoughts. Meanwhile, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context from which I am really speaking today. Um, so this, um, the stories I'm going to share and the lessons sort of learned from those stories um, took place when I was an assistant director and youth services librarian in a small town, about 5,000 folks in South Central Wisconsin, Evansville, as I mentioned. Um, this was a less than full-time position, so it was 32 hours a week. And um, my charge as this, you know, in that position was programming and outreach for everyone under 18, as well as older adults. So it was like a youth services position, but it also had a lot of outreach with um, our older adult population as well. 
And then there were some public desk hours and collection development duties mixed in. So depending on your context, this might sound very familiar. It's like multiple hats, not a lot of hours in the week, um, trying to, you know, sort of expend your energy in the best and most effective and most, um, you know, um, beneficial way possible um, for yourself and for the community that you're working in. So I'll just share some examples of the sort of work um, when I started this position, the kinds of outreach that we were doing. Again, depending on your context, some of this will feel very familiar. Others of you may have different, um, you know, different examples of outreach work that you do that you can think about. So we would do a lot of tabling with like hands-on activities at community events. So that means like bring in the button maker to national night out and setting up a table to the community energy fair. I always loved that one because um, we would take old dictionary pages and like make buttons out of um, old like dictionary drawings and stuff like that, um, sort of repurposing old, old materials. Um, and then, you know, tabling at Week of the Young Child events and things like that. Just um, a lot of um, community events, you know, hours spent in the evening chatting with families and connecting with teachers and that sort of thing. It was great. Um, we would do a lot of visits to schools promoting our summer library program and other um, programs like our, um, you know, Halloween programs and things, excuse me, things like that. Um, we spent time working with our library system um, to promote county and system libraries at the county fair. So that's like handing out tattoos at the Rock County Fair. Um, everybody would sign up for a table shift and um, yeah, and you'd, you know, promote your um, colleague libraries around the system. Um, we also, while I was there, we also went through a strategic planning process that led to a building expansion. So um, another, you know, channel for community outreach was to do a, com um, a community survey where we were getting information from folks about the, um, the resources that they were using at the library, what they were aware that we had, um, things of that nature. And then for me as a programming and outreach um, librarian, you know, I was really focused on those two areas. Um, I ended up, you know, sort of rolling a lot of programming into my outreach work. So that meant that I was doing a lot of um, sort of short early literacy programs at childcare centers. Um, visits to summer camp. So you can see um, on the screen here, there's a photo of me um, doing a story time, probably super sweaty at um, a summer camp outside at a park. Um, so those that blurs the line a little bit again between programming and outreach. Um, but those visits, we ended up just doing a lot of um, sort of traditional library programming, but out in um, outside of the building. So we'd always be ready, no matter what we were doing, we'd be ready to talk up our ongoing programs and upcoming special events. We're promoting the library card, um, like library card sign up, sharing resources like Libby. At that time, it was Overdrive for those of you in the public library realm. So talking up Overdrive and um, helping people, you know, with their devices on, in the moment as much as possible. Um, so these opportunities were always fun and a way to sort of reinforce connections with current library users and to help put faces to the library out in the community for people who maybe didn't use the library already. So let's revisit. I'm going to come back to this definition chart um, several times throughout this presentation just to sort of take a look at what fits and what might not fit quite so tidily um, on this spectrum. So um, I wasn't necessarily working under this definition of outreach at this time, but we do see some of these elements showing up in my outreach examples that I shared. So a lot of these were short term. Some of them were literally like over the course of a couple of hours, you would be sitting at an event, doing an activity, and then, you know, everybody would leave and go home. Um, frequently, there were these were times to market library events, programs, and services. So marketing was frequently, you know, one of the primary goals of um, being at these outreach events. 
it was definitely focused on, you know, in my reflection back on this now, on what can the library do for you and how can we fit into your life? So it was very, um, you know, we, there wasn't a lot of conversation about like, what skills or talents do you have um, public? You know, it was very much what can the library do for you and learning from them about, um, you know, what maybe their needs were, what they were working on at the moment, what they were excited about and plugging um, the library into that in some way. It, with regards to whether one group was benefiting most, probably if I'm being honest, the library fitting the most from um, participating in these events because we would see additional people at our events and interacting with us. So there's some question there, you know, maybe somebody really opportunity to, um, you know, Um, those activities. Um, so I'm going to go back to our story now. So I am definitely someone who thrives on a very full schedule and loves to be out in the world. But even when you are super organized about your outreach and thinking far ahead about your activities and ordering your supplies, and even when there's help from other staff and volunteers, keeping up the pace um, is difficult, if not impossible. I'm sure this will not sound unfamiliar to many of you. Um, you can say yes and yes and yes to so many outreach opportunities. And, um, and it's, hard, it's hard to disentangle yourself from that. Um, so I recognized that I really needed to rescale the sheer number of weekly and monthly and annual commitments I was making on behalf of the library. So that was sort of in my mind, you know, a couple of years into my position. Also a couple of years into this position, that's when, um, for me anyway, I really started to see a lot more conversation happening in the wider library world about community engagement. So we, you know, probably can pinpoint about when we started seeing that phrase and that term really showing up a lot. Um, so at first it was sort of conflated in my mind with outreach. So Clearly, community engagement is happening in and with the community, and that's obviously what I was doing with all these outreach visits. So what could the difference possibly be? Um, but as I read and learned a little bit more from, from sources like the Harwood and Aspen Institutes, and most critically, resources related to um, a community development framework called Asset-Based Community-Led Development, which is informer, informally known as ABCD. I'll share some resources related to that if you're not familiar with ABCD already. Um, I really began to understand that engagement is a concept and approach that is distinct from outreach, or maybe more appropriately, it's in a different place on a spectrum. And it really is about um, sort of making connections directly with folks and I, you know, helping to identify skills and strengths that already exist in a community and bringing those things together for collective action. Um, so we can revisit this um, definition a little bit. So um, we've got, you know, community engagement, it's long term, it's really focused on relationship building. Again, it's what A and B can do together. The whole community benefits. It's about connection making. That's really the, the thrust and the goal. Um, and it is cyclical. It is um, learning from the past, reflect, taking time to reflect on your work and then um, doing that again um, in a cycle. So I want to um, share one example from this same context um, before I was actually a community engagement librarian, sort of more intentionally doing, doing this work. Um, for me, frequently, engagement is easier to think back on and identify. Um, so 
Um, an example that I have about um, engagement leading to collective action. So again, coming back to that idea of what can A and B do together, happened in this same small town, Evansville, and involved um, some of the volunteers who supported the library's programming and outreach efforts, which was sort of one of my conduits into um, this, um, this particular example that I'm gonna share. So there was this cadre of retired teachers and like they're, you know, people they knew um, and had worked with. So just people in the community who tended to organize themselves around certain projects and events. So I know that no matter what kind of library or organization you are a part of today, you know these folks. They might be students at your um, college or university. They might be faculty or teachers. They're volunteers, they're part of the PTO, small business owners, parents. They are the people who help get things done in your context, whether that's at a school, college or university or other cultural heritage institution. So I knew and had, you know, pretty close connections with this particular group of folks after a couple of years because they helped with school age programming um, at the library. So this group sort of came together with some other folks. Um, and this was, um, you know, some of these people were current teachers, you know, just neighbors in the community and a literal Boy Scout who was working on his Eagle Scout project. And together this, larger group came up with an idea to really promote and elevate youth literacy in the community. And um, this is, you know, it, it was an interesting and, you know, interesting effort to be part of anyway, but it's, it's critical to think about the fact that this idea was really rooted in conversations that had already been happening with, with folks in, um, in the community. So school district reading specialists and then informal conversations with lots of different parents and families. Um, those informal conversations were where the real engagement was happening. And most of those were happening even before I got involved. It was like this group of, you know, sort of um, the, the drivers of this um, had been having these conversations, you know, with their former colleagues at the school district about, you know, um, what they were seeing in terms of reading scores and what they, you know, wished kids had access to um, in order to support um, youth literacy um, in the district and throughout the community. Um, so, from my perspective um, and from the public library perspective, that ended up being the location for some of this, um, this group of, you know, sort of volunteers. Um, this is where the public library is where they would come together. And I was able to sit in occasionally and the group worked together to talk about their goal, which was to elevate youth literacy in the community by making it as easy as possible for youth to get their hands on books that they could keep all year round. So based on like the conversations that had happened previous to my direct involvement, you know, it was clear that what, um, what kids and families were really interested in was just being able to, you know, um, any time of day, any time of year, any day of the week, be able to like pick up a new, um, some new reading material and sort of, in, you know, dig into that. So, um, so that was, that was really the goal um, that this group was um, working toward. Um, so in those conversations at the public library, this group figured out the following components of like this project, effort, initiative, whatever you want to call it. So they made a plan for some physical infrastructure pieces. In this case, it meant five or six little free libraries around town in residents' front yards. The Eagle Scout, in a shocking turn of events, was tapped to build a handful um, of those little free libraries. And um, different neighbors around, you know, in different neighborhoods around town would install those in their yards um, so that across the, the community and the town, kids would have access to um, different kinds of reading material. And then members of the group that was meeting in the library would head up stacking them with easy and leveled readers. So they ended up getting many, many book donations. And there was this um, 
you know, this effort, this sweat equity, basically, from community members who were willing to um, stock these little free libraries with sort of refresh them with reading material. Um, and then there would be the, you know, sort of idea of the little free library, which is, you know, people are contributing books um, after they've read them and things like that. Um, this group also generated a role for the public library. So I think the way we helped out was by contributing donated books from our um, friend's bookstore and also provided physical space for meetings and for book sorting tasks, especially over the summer when the school buildings were closed. Um, so yeah, so that was um, help that we could provide. And you'll note that I personally did not need to be present for those things to um, be happening or, um, you know, I could do a little bit of work putting donated books into boxes or bring the boxes into our community room, but I didn't need to be present. I wasn't running a program. I wasn't uh, facilitating a meeting. You know, it was just kind of um, operating free of, um, free of me. <laughs> um, and then they defined roles for other volunteers. I mentioned this, so book sorting and distribution. Um, and then they did want to make sure that there was some informational material for families. So some things that they stocked the Little Free Libraries with included bookmarks, promoting the public library summer reading program. So they really wanted to reinforce that the public library also had lots of, you know, curated good reading material um, and that we could order books from other libraries and things like that. Um, early literacy tips for parents and then a list like a little map of where to find the other Little Free Libraries around town. So I can reflect back on this, right? So um, this was not a funded effort. It wasn't a grant. Um, it didn't even really have a title or a name. I remember having conversations with my director where I'd be trying to describe like what this group was and what they were working on. And it was like, Nancy and Nancy just kind of need the re meeting room for some book sorting and you know, that, that sort of thing. So, um, the library was not the instigator or the primary coordinator of this program. Um, in terms of sustainability, you know, was it sustainable? Pieces of it prob probably were. So there, um, you know, the physical infrastructure, the little free libraries are mostly still there as far as I know. Um, whether those are being stacked, you know, sort of refreshed with donated materials by volunteers all the time. Um, my guess is, you know, I'm going to assume that that may have fallen off, but, you know, hopefully um, the book exchange nature of Little Free Libraries is in place and um, people are still making use of those, um, of that physical infrastructure. Um, was it able to be evaluated? Um, possibly down the road, you know, you might hopefully see reading scores um, go up, um, you know, from reading specialists. Um, that might be an outcome that um, the reading specialists might see in their classrooms down the line. Um, a significant change that did occur was that a group of people who hadn't necessarily worked together, um, you know, in previous to this project came together to do something and pieces of that effort do still exist as I said. So this isn't going to you know be a direct it's not like this is going to check all of these community engagement boxes. However, we can see lots of these engagement elements showing up in um, sort of what led up to this example and then in the example itself. So um, this was a longer term effort. This was multiple months, um, you know, multi-year in, um, in this particular instance. Um, and this did have a lot to do with relationship building, um, you know, sort of facilitating people meeting each other, both in terms of um, the group that got the program stood up program. It wasn't really a program effort, whatever um, stood up and, um, and then in terms of, um, you know, teachers and parents develop, developing relationships, talking about what, um, what they would like to see for their kids in terms of like access to reading material and things like that. Um, crucially, what A and B can do together. So this was truly um, 
a, you know, a collective effort. Um, this really did involve lots of people across the community. Um, it was almost like the community members saw the assets and resources that the library could provide. And so that's why they came to us, um, rather than us being the driver of it and um, sort of assuming what um, would be most useful or um, the best resource we could offer this group. Um, yeah, the whole community benefited um, every, you know, um, more kids had more access to more reading material, um, you know, throughout these different activities, um, connections were made. And um, in terms of it being cyclical, um, I'm going to share um, this this graph with you or this uh, graphic with you after the fact, but um, we can really see it kind of looks confusing, but if you, um, you know, if you read along the, um, the different loops on the left hand side, um, there was a period of learning about, um, about what the, what the question that they wanted answered or what their goal was going to be um, in terms of um, promoting youth literacy. Um, they're going to be considering action. So as we're going down on that green arrow, considering the different um, things that they could do to help promote youth literacy around the, around the community. They made various asks of people, including myself and the public library. Um, various people got engaged, including myself. Um, I have to move my um, chat here. Do, do, do. Whoops, it wasn't yet. Um, there was a period of evaluation and reflection, um, and sometimes that either leads to recovery or burnout, depending on how people are feeling um, after the fact. So um, I just thought this would be an interesting moment to share this um, cycle of engagement, um, and I'll share that again at the end, so you'll have access to that later. Um, but what I came to understand as I reflected back on this project is that the library did not need to be the primary driver of this community literacy effort. In this case, it was really much healthier for the work and coordination to be shared and really organized from the ground up rather than relying on one institution or a sheer force of personality um, to get the work done. This was led by the community. Relationships were strengthened. I met people I hadn't met before, and I didn't need to expend a ton of extra energy while still being a solid participant and a part of this collective um, effort. So being more conscious about engagement and really stepping back more frequently meant that I also was able to right size or at least better size my own commitments and workload. And that was helping with some of the risk of burnout that we see um, here on, on the screen and that I referred to earlier. So my hope is to take these stories and pull out some lessons um, that I learned and have sort of clarified along the way, although I'm still a work in progress myself, um, to help clarify, streamline, and assess your own organization's outreach work and your engagement work. Um, so these are some things that I was able to put into more intentional practice as a community engagement librarian um, in the position that followed my time um, as a youth librarian. So now we're going to get into some practicalities. Um, so in terms of how you can plan for and make space for both outreach and engagement in your organization. Um, so as far as planning your time goes, so you can see pretty clearly from the stories I shared that these approaches require you to sort of think about and plan your time a little bit differently. So outreach on the left hand side can be thought of as a discrete activity or action. It requires time for prep, participation at the actual event or visit, and then some number of hours for reset or follow up. Um, so for some examples of this are tabling at a new student orientation, classroom visits, promoting library services, um, tabling at a national night out event, tabling at that county fair. Um, so this is, um, I guess you can think about it as a sprint. Um, so in a week with one outreach visit, you might need five or six hours over a couple of days to handle the phases of prep, 
participation and reset. Many of these things can be routinized, right? So if you have an outreach tote that's stacked with different brochures and pens and stickers and a tablecloth, um, and you have a checklist that reminds you of each component you need for your visit. Um, so that work is sort of front loaded, but it can make your routine to prep for your visits much simpler. You will not be surprised to hear that engagement is a little bit grayer. Um, engagement, you know, as I was talking about it in that last example, that was based on, that was over a period of years and lots of just sort of informal conversations that were happening um, between parents and teachers and um, other folks in the community. So it's ongoing in the background and it requires a different sort of energy scale. So I've heard the process or activity of engagement described as having 100 cups of coffee, um, knocking on 100 doors, having 100 conversations. I don't think anyone needs to literally have 100 conversations, but that's sort of the scale that you're, that you're thinking about. There's not a predetermined output or outcome. You're not gonna like go to an activity and give away all of your marketing material and then you're gonna go home. Um, rather, it's, it's just grayer. You're doing a lot of listening, connecting, and maybe if you're in that position, bringing people together or helping bring people together for more listening and connecting. And if something comes out of that, like a community, literacy initiative, that's fantastic. But it's not, um, but if, if the thing that comes out of that bringing people together is just other people mixing and mingling and meeting each other for the first time, then that's also fantastic. That's also a great outcome there. So this is obviously very different from a sprint. It's more like building a routine of a lunchtime walk into your daily work schedule. So, you know, in a given week, you might spend one planned hour literally having coffee with a community member or a faculty member, a teacher, plus 30 unplanned minutes of talking with another community member or a student or a TA in line at the coffee shop. So it's just trickier to plan ahead for, but it's basically being open to connecting with people when and how you encounter them or they encounter you. So I've had these conversations with folks on the bus in hallways of school buildings. And my favorite period of time is in the moments before or after library or community events. So like community meetings, it's the, um, the chit chat time, you know, as um, people are coming into that, that community room. Um, sometimes as people are logging into, you know, the Zoom meeting for the day, right? Um, it's structuring your time and your mindset to not immediately, you know, scurry away back to your office or the desk after you've completed um, your task or wrapped up that meeting or that program. So let's talk about prioritization, which relates to planning your time. In the midst of all of our other work, particularly if the terms outreach and engagement are not literally built into your job title, Finding the time and the bandwidth to do this outreach and engagement work can be challenging, if not downright impossible. So even when I was a literal community engagement librarian, I still was only working around 50%. Um, I was still working 50% public service desk time. So as with anything in the library, cultural heritage and nonprofit world, Prioritization is really important because our institutional resources tend to be limited. So 50% of my time was going to be on the desk. So I needed to really think carefully about what I was going to prioritize and where. Um, so I would encourage you to carve out some time to plan out your outreach commitments in advance, um, if possible. So some specific things to look at or consider. Where and how might you scale things a little bit differently? So you, do you need to actually be present at the outreach event? Um, is there another partner or organization who will be there with whom you could share table space? Can you shift a monthly visit to quarterly instead? 
if you could only choose three outreach opportunities to attend um, over the course of a year or maybe a summer, which would they be? Are there events or meetings where you'll get the most bang for your buck, whatever that means to you? Um, so is that a back to school night, for example, where you get to introduce yourself to new families in the school district? Welcome week events at your campus? Is there a neighborhood that typically has less easy access to the library? And so if you're invited to their community picnic, you definitely wanna show up for that. If your organization has a strategic plan in place, can you look to your strategic goals to help you determine where and how to focus your outreach efforts? For, you, for example, are you really trying to make connections to the tweens and teens in your community as a public library? So you can let these existing decision-making frameworks guide your outreach planning and do some of that practice saying, thanks, and we'll keep this on our list in the future to opportunities that are outside of the scope of what you can do. Regarding engagement, prioritization, again, will look a little bit different. In this case, you aren't really needing to prioritize from a pre-existing list, list of requests or events. Rather, because this work necessarily is ongoing and at a really different pace, it's more about prioritizing this less tangible task on an internal level. So this is something you might need to advocate or make the case for if you are not the sole, sole person making decisions about where you're going to spend your time and energy. What this looks like, how this might show up is this, internal support and permission to spend a little extra time chatting with people in and outside of the building. And that might just be simply asking, how are things going? You know, not with a preconceived notion of what they might need or what they might be dealing with at the time. It looks like support for staff to be a presence at community meetings, not as an organizer or a coordinator necessarily, but as a participant, as an attendee, as an active listener. So, you know, showing up to um, the, the community, you know, sort of comprehensive planning meetings and just going and being a presence, meeting people, saying hi. This is, that can be organizational work, you know? It's, um, it's important just to be meeting people and um, be a presence um, out in the community, to really be part of the community. And a recognition that outputs or results may be a little hazy or not super concrete. Um, so, you know, this ongoing engagement can help staff recognize when it would be beneficial to have some kind of structured conversation about a particular need or concern. So let's say you're hearing from people on the bus that transportation is an issue um, or something related to mental health support in the community. So I'm not saying that our organizations need to be or should be the entities pitch, pitching solutions to these things, but the library or your organization might be well positioned to be a gathering place for people to come together and have a conversation about what the community feels would be the best way forward. I just wanna speak to multi-type libraries and organizations for a moment. Hopefully I've been reinforcing that this is not just a public library thing or idea here, um, but I do wanna acknowledge that I am speaking from my experience as someone who worked primarily in and with public libraries. So multi-type libraries and other cultural heritage organizations can run with outreach and engagement efforts as well. When it comes to prioritizing groups and or events for outreach efforts, staff at schools, academic libraries, archives, museums, and historical societies can also be guided by any strategic goals, plans, or decision-making frameworks that exist at your institution. And I would hope that the idea of ongoing community engagement and conversations with um, the folks in your community, that resonates you know, across library types and organizational types. Um, though the kinds of conversations you might be having one-on-one -on -one or in groups will likely look different depending on each of your context. Um, so for example, in a school, I'm just riffing here, maybe you're having a conversation with students and um, they, you know, 
are looking for some help in, in um, standing up an after school club that they really want to organize and get underway. Um, and so those conversations can turn into collective action on the students part with the library providing some support there. All right, so Evaluation and measuring is not necessarily, you know, built into today's um, presentation, but I don't want to leave without mentioning it either. So I just want to revisit a little bit how um, and what you might measure related to outreach using the leading differently chart again. Um, so you might um, want to keep track of how many people attend an event or stop at your table, how many marketing things people take, so how many marketing objects people walk away with. Um, in terms of survey participation, so if you are doing um, a strategic planning survey, you can keep track of um, how many responses you're getting and from which um, demographic groups those responses are coming in. Um, in terms of understanding the impact that your outreach efforts are having, you might see a change in the number of people uh, signing up for events, visiting the building, checking out materials, and being more aware of what is available at and through the library. How might you measure your engagement efforts? So inevitably, it's going to be grayer um, in terms of what you measure and where you look to understand the impact of your engagement efforts. Um, I, um, I know we're getting close on time today, so I am not going to give you a tour of um, this self-assessment tool. There is a really great um, tool from an organization called Building the Field of Community Engagement. Um, this is a tool that I have found to be super helpful in terms of establishing sort of a really um, honest baseline of where you are as an organization and then to revisit the tool annually to understand if and how the needle is moving um, you know, between community outreach and community engagement. Um, if you can have some community members assist with that assessment, all the better. Um, and that tool is very much not library specific. So it is a tool that can be utilized by pretty much any community facing or serving institution. Um, I, that is included in the resources um, in the slides today, so I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that. All right, so um, as we wrap up our time together today, I have some takeaways for you um, that outreach work and engagement work both have places within organizations. While there may be overlap from time to time, they are different approaches with different outcomes. Timescales related to these um, approaches have to be different. So outreach is pre-planned with short bursts of energy and engagement is a slower burn. It's literally thinking about having those 100 cups of coffee with people, plus holding spaces for collective community discovery and action when it's appropriate. Prioritization is really critical to both of these approaches. And you'll want to do some considering about how you'll first establish a baseline within your organization, and then what you'll measure in order to understand if and how the needle is moving due to your outreach work and your engagement work. All right, here are our resources for today. So all of these are linked um, and we'll make sure to um, share a PDF of the slides um, today. But um, yeah, the community engagement assessment tool from Nexus is um, the self-assessment tool that I mentioned. Um, it really is an interesting um, way to sort of understand where your organization is falling on that outreach to engagement spectrum. And um, yeah, it's sort of designed um, to be participatory in terms of how the assessment happens too. So um, you can um, engage community members in that work with you, which is um, even better. So, all right, um, are there questions or comments? I know we have just about, um, just a couple of minutes left. Um, if anything came up in the chat um, along the way, I'd be happy to address those, or if folks just have things they wanna dig into a little bit more, that'd be great.
All right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, let's see here. You can. Um, Let's see. So um, I will share my email at the end. Um, I always like to just give the opportunity for some final words um, of, for folks to share in chat. So, um, you know, if you are able to um, and would like to contribute this, um, I'd love to know an idea or a pondering, a concept that you're taking away from today. Um, that would be um, super interesting to hear. Um, yeah, so we'll just give some space for that to happen. And while you're working on that, thinking about that, um, here's my email. Um, yeah, please feel free to follow up if you have specific questions that I um, didn't get to or address today. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. Thank you, Shirley. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. I'm glad <laughs> you learned some new things today. So, yeah. I'm glad to hear that, Matthew. All right. We will send the recording to you all next week. Andy, um, we have another Will's World short coming up in August. Is that right? That is true. We have Will's World shorts with Barbara Alvarez, who is Wisconsin's 2022 LJ Mover and Shaker. And she's been doing research on intersection of reproductive health information and library and information science. So that is August 19th at one. Um, I'll check a link in the chat if you want to head over and register. Awesome. Thank you so much. So keep an eye out in chat for that. All right. Andy just posted that. So, um, yeah. Well, that brings us to um, right up until 2 o'clock today. Um, let's see. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you all today. Again, please feel free to um, send me a note if you'd like to talk about any more of this in more depth. And um, yeah, it was a real pleasure. So um, have a great rest of your Friday, everybody. And um, we will hopefully see you next time. Shirley, I just wanted to mention that I got your message in the chat and yeah, that sounds super, um, super interesting. Um, yeah, just, um, yeah, I think um, it definitely makes sense to reach out to um, folks at the, the at, you know, your city agencies and um, learn from them what, you know, what, um, if you know if the library can help provide anything or help make connections to people who can so yeah thanks thanks yeah. absolutely yeah that's um that's great and then yeah if the library can be a conduit for collecting community donations i think that's um you know always um something helpful that that the library can offer so that's great Awesome. All right. Well, have a good rest of your day. And um, yeah, thank you for attending. Um, and we'll see you next time.